We're still working on the, um, the handout. And we'll pick back up um, on where we left off last week. But a couple weeks back, um, I shared this old Zen parable with you, and I just wanted to read it again because it, uh, in some ways it kind of gets us to uh, what we're talking about tonight. And the Zen parable goes like this. An old man accidentally fell into the river rapids leading to a high and dangerous waterfall. Onlookers feared for his life. Miraculously, he came out alive and unharmed downstream at the bottom of the falls. People asked him how he managed to survive. I accommodated myself to the water, not the water to me. Without thinking, I allowed myself to be shaped by it. Plunging into the swirl, I came out with the swirl. This is how I survived. And that's one of my favorite old Zen parables. And one of the things I really like about it is this idea of flexibility, of fluidity, of how when we come across something that is just this incredibly powerful force, like water, an incredibly powerful force, um, that in spite of the fact we know that there's no way we can overcome this force, that our natural instinct is to resist, to kind of struggle against it. And it, part of that is the survival instinct, and so it's understandable. But what this parable is talking about is his realization that there's really no way that he can fight the water, but he can flow with the water. And in so doing, he can, um, he can use the water to his own benefit. He can flow with nature the way things are happening. Um, last week we started talking about um, the self, the idea of kind of the ego self with regard to or, or as it's talked about in this practice. Um, and before we got into that, I used, uh, I used a term called Dhamma Vinaya which means the doctrine and the discipline. And I wanted to just hit that term one more time. A good translation of that word, that term Dhamma Vinaya is also, well, the doctrine and the discipline is how it's often translated, but knowledge and practice is another real good translation. And really what it's saying is, is that we can learn a great deal from books and from teachings and from all of these different wonderful things that we have access to. Um, but to really get the most out of it, we also need to practice it. And that we can practice by itself, but we'll really get the most out of that if we combine it with what we can learn about the practice and how it works and why it works. So these two things, they go hand in hand and they can really help us. So I wanted to point that out, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why in every one of our meditations when we get together, we begin by doing a practice. And then we have this first-hand experience of how a lot of what we talk about is really true. And so there's this application of the principles. So that's a wonderful thing. It can make it much more meaningful. Um, Pardon me for one moment. Okay. Let that go and see how it works. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of this idea of the ego or I or self um, and the way the, the, way the uh, meditation tradition talks about it. And so before we get started on that, I wanted to do kind of a little disambiguation or talk about, you know, in, in Western psychology and in Western culture, we talk about um, the ego or sense of self and um, 
the way we're going to talk about it, while there are some similarities, it's really kind of a different thing. Um, so I don't want anybody to get the idea that that this teaching is about letting go of your self-identity so that you become like a doormat or you become a target for you know being being used by people or that you somehow lower your self-esteem. It's really not that at all, but we're so accustomed to kind of this Western idea of what what ego is or ego consciousness, what the self is, what this feeling of I is, that it can be a little confusing to start to go into this sort of a conversation about how we work with the I in a different way or how meditation practice is referring to this idea of self. So, um, so to kind of just make that disambiguation, this is... Um, it is important and helpful to have healthy self-esteem and to have a good sense of self and to have, um, you know, to want to care for yourself and nurture yourself. All those things are important and, in fact, they're part of the practice. So, yeah, that's wonderful. So when we talk about starting to let go of a strong idea of self, it's not about letting go of self-esteem or self-protection or self-conservation or any of these kinds of things, but it's really about letting go of some of the aspects of the self that lead to mental affliction or mental torment is one of the words that we've used. Um, everybody's probably had the experience of doing something and just sort of completely forgetting about yourself, just completely, you know, wild abandon. It's just you're doing something and you're so into the experience there's no thought of do I look silly doing this or am I being childish or you know it's just fun or it's just wonderful um, that's an experience where there's really not a whole lot of thinking about this is me this is what I want this is what I don't want this is who I am whereas on the flip side we've all had the experience of thinking very much that way this is who I am this is what I want this is what I don't want this is what I'm trying to protect and there's a real difference in the quality of those two experiences so the first feeling I mean you're still you uh, we're not saying that you don't exist but it's about noticing how the more you gravitate to this idea of me, this is what I want, this is how I want you to be, this is how I want the world to go, this kind of a thing, you start to notice that there's also a feeling of, it just feels, I feel a little uh, weird in that, you know, I don't feel comfortable, I don't feel free, this is sort of where the mental affliction um, starts to come from. There's an old saying, um, I have no idea who to attribute this one to, it, it has been attributed to everybody from the Buddha to Jesus to um, to different uh, Zen masters, so I have no idea. But anyway, it's kind of a neat saying. A man uh, was sitting with uh, some sort of a master, some sort of a teacher, and he said, I want happiness. And the master replied, first remove I, that's ego, then remove want, that's desire, and then you'll be left with only happiness. So whoever said that, right on the money. That's a wonderful way to look at it. Um, a man said to the master, I want happiness. I want happiness. And the master replied, first remove I, that's ego, then remove want, that's desire, and then you'll be left with only happiness. So, and that's kind of a neat thing. But it's one of those things that, yeah, we all recognize that there's sort of a, there's a truth to that. We recognize that, yeah, when I let go of that, that part of me that can sometimes be, be quite self-centered or quite, you know, quite selfish or greedy, um, when I let go of that part of me, I tend to feel much more peaceful and much more centered, much more free. And then it's almost like I can, I can sort of float over the bumps of life a little bit rather than being really jarred by each and every one of them. So when we talk about, in the context of the practice, this idea of I or me or self, I'm not saying it in a negative way like, oh, that's something 
you know, that's a bad thing. More than being a thing, I is the way we look at things through the lens of that I and that want. So it's more of a way of looking at things as opposed to a thing itself. Um, on the handout from last week, um, and this is uh, the top of page three, and you don't have to follow along at all, but I'm just referencing it so you know. The one thing everybody has in common is that desire to be happy. I want happiness. I want to be happy. Uh, just like the, the person said to the master. And another way of saying that is I would like to suffer less. I'd like to experience less sadness, worry, fear, anger, all of those afflictive emotions. And so that's a neat thing because it really does cut through everything else. It cuts through race and religion and class and age and everything else. You know, you could really gather everybody together and everyone would agree, yeah, I would like to be happy and I would like to suffer less. So how, how we go about getting the happiness and avoiding the suffer, suffering is where we might have different ideas and approaches. And regardless of the approach or even what it is we go after, it's helpful to ask the following questions. Do the things we go after contain happiness? And do the things we try to avoid contain suffering? So sometimes, on a real basic level, you can say, well, yeah, you know, if, if I'm hungry, I need to eat. And so, you know, that's a way of trying to be happy. I need to preserve my life. I need to have a healthy body. Or if, um, you know, if there's a fire, I don't want to run into the fire because it would be painful, it would be destructive, so I want to avoid those kinds of things. But aside from kind of the survival instinct stuff that we all get, behind that there is this, I want to be happy and so how am I going to go about getting that happiness? Just like the man said to the master, I want happiness. Well, who is it that wants it? I do. You know, what is the, you know, what are you, I want happiness. And to some extent, yeah, letting go of the I, letting go of the want, what remains is happiness. Or in the context of this teaching, you start to get at what is your true nature, who you really are when there aren't ideas there. When we do this meditation practice um, that we did in the beginning, a lot of times I'll mention, yeah, sometimes you come upon a part of your body where there's something that you would normally call pain. And when you come across that pain, there's a reaction to it. There's a negative reaction. We start thinking, that's pain. I don't like it. I don't want it. And while maybe that's true, we also can have that experience of, what if I don't label it as the bad thing? Uh, what if I don't give it names or classifications or judge it in any way or sort of set myself up to resist it? But what if I just flow with it, like that, that Zen parable? What if I just flow with it? Either way, it's going to be there, right? I mean, you can't, by resisting pain that's in your body, you can't stop that pain. So what happens when you change your relationship to what is already there? What happens when you allow space for the pain to be as it is and you don't start to come up with this is a bad thing, this is a problem, this is something I need to be fighting against? What happens when you let it all just be as it's going to be anyway, but you change your relationship with what's actually happening? So this is kind of an interesting thing to think about. Uh, in here I also wrote, outside of us, there are only objects. And technically that's true. I mean, anything outside of this thing that I call my body and I call myself in a conventional sense, anything that isn't this is some sort of an object out there, kind of a neutral thing. Outside of us, there are only objects. So sometimes I can see an object and that object will cause suffering in me. And sometimes I can see an object and it will cause happiness in me. Sometimes another person can see the same object that causes me suffering and that might be something that causes happiness to them or vice versa. 
So it's not that the things themselves necessarily contain happiness or unhappiness, but it's in many ways our relationship to them. So sometimes we have a hard time understanding this because it is just a little weird. It's like at first, yeah, you know, I sort of get that, but uh, you know, it. I mean, we've all sort of spent our lives looking at ourselves and our relationship to the world around us in a certain way. And so while there's a part of us that kind of gets this, then there's a, a big part of us that also is sort of, I'm not sure. Um, but most of us have spent our whole lives trying to find it, you know, the cause of happiness, the ingredients of happiness out there. But it's not out there. And so we tend to feel frustrated and lost uh, as a result, or agitated, or depressed, or all of those things, or angry. So everyone has had that experience, you know, the feeling of, I feel lonely and so I want a partner. Um, and so you might find the ideal partner, but if you still feel um, unhappy about yourself, you know, even the ideal partner isn't going to necessarily fix that. Or if you're, um, if you're unhappy and you think the ingredients of happiness are in material possessions, you go out and get the material possession, then you've probably had the experience of, oh, there's really no happiness in the material possession itself. It's outside of us as objects. So there's this me going out looking for what I want, which ultimately is happiness, but it creates this construct of I. And the curious thing is that the more we look for what we want out there, the more we start to feel separated from the rest of the world and the rest of life. From that experience arises feelings of separation. You, know, you really start to have this me versus you, mine versus yours, theirs versus ours, you know, it's, it's creating all of this separation. And then thoughts of scarcity come up, how much is available, zero-sum game, you know, if you get it, I won't, if I get it first, then you can't have it, all of this. If you win, I lose, feelings of greed, anger, ill will, all of that is really a manifestation of this strong sense of self. This is me, this is what I want. And it creates this conflict within us. So not to say, okay, I don't exist, it doesn't matter what I want, I need to just not care. It's not that at all. Um, having a strong sense of self and caring for yourself and nurturing yourself and, you know, nurturing your own self-esteem, all of that is very important and very valuable. But what you realize is that on the flip side, kind of in this meditation sense of the I or the ego or the self, that those are really the substrate upon which desire and aversion are able to manifest, that greed, that ill will, that craving, that dislike, any of those feelings. Those are the kind of the the thing that a strong identification with I and with ego self and the me as a separate being from everything else, it sort of allows all that to manifest itself. It allows it to show up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sense? It absolutely makes sense. You know, self-medication, whether it's drugs or alcohol or with other stuff. I mean, that, yeah, that's so common. That's so common. And I think that's very much what it is. 
um, is that people recognize, oh, there's, there's a feeling of pain here. There's a feeling of suffering here. Or I can go out all day and work really hard um, to earn money or to move up or to get my degree or whatever it is, but I come home and then when things quiet down, I realize here I am with all of this negative stuff, you know, in my mind. Um, I'm not good enough. I did bad stuff before. I'm a schmuck. You know, whatever it is. And, and so, yeah, you know, you're kind of replaying this over and over. Or you're thinking about bad things that happened in the past, replaying them over and over. Or you're imagining really horrific things that might happen in the future and you're kind of playing those over and over again. That is scary stuff. It's painful. And so, yeah, you know, a, a lot of times, um, I mean, I, you know, I really have, a, and having, you know, had my own experience with alcohol and all that kind of stuff, yeah, I, I get it. It's like, wow, if I can take this and just erase all that, why not? You know, and it seems to make some sense. It seems like a rational thing. Um, Ram Das, he's a uh, spiritual teacher. One one thing he said that I thought was cool. He experienced. Uh, he experimented back in the '60s with uh, Timothy Leary, kind of the whole LSD and the psychedelics thing. And he said um, he was talking about that. And one of the things he said is that he really felt like psychedel psychedelics, the experience of that, helped him approach God. But the only problem was he could only stay with them for about two hours, and then it was over, you know? And then the grief of sort of coming upon what it was you were looking for and then having to, to leave it there and, and go away, it, he, he said that, that experience of grief, you know, just became, it was like it wasn't worth it. The two hours there wasn't worth the rest of the time knowing I, I couldn't be there anymore, you know? So just kind of an amazing thing. And so, yeah, in some way, I think we all have had that experience of tapping into the real thing, you know, authenticity, um, spiritual union, the divine, you know, whatever you, whatever sort of the word is that describes that for you, we've had that experience of it. Sometimes it was you know, many, many years ago when we were young and we think back, and, and, you know, we think, boy, what happened? Um, and it's really that we have lost touch with that authenticity. You know, we're not, we're not there anymore. And the grief of that, the grief of not being there, I really think that's behind a lot of the self-medication. Yeah. You touched on bad thoughts. You know, sometimes trying to get to sleep, you know, I'll be all of sleep, and then all of a sudden I'll think of something in my past. Like that. Yep. And then I can't go to sleep. Yeah. So how do you get rid of that? Yeah, bad it's thought that just pops in your head. Um, and that's it's a like big. You don't have any control over it. It, it. it absolutely is. There, um, I had uh, just to share a quick story with you that's sort of along the lines of what you're talking about. Um, I had lunch with my mom uh, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about you know, this kind of stuff. And, and she said, you know, she said things that happened to me, uh, you know, uh, 70 years ago, um, she's going to be 82, you know, she, she remembers these things. And she said, that stuff never leaves you. You know, it still comes back and you remember it from time to time. And it sort of puts you right back in this, this place of reliving, you know, whatever the fearful or, or painful experience was. And um, she was talking about how even with um, people around her now who are very uh, kind and compassionate and loving and well-meaning, who out of fear for her safety will say things to her that kind of frighten her, you know. And then she kind of, she's left with that, you know, sort of replaying it. And so she, she said that stuff, it's real. It never goes away. All that stuff, you know, you're kind of constantly replaying it. Now you hit on something here because that's really a big part of what this practice is, is realizing that a lot of that suffering that we experience, and suffering is kind of the blanket term we use for it, 
but like those those troublesome thoughts, those sad memories, um, sometimes feelings of guilt or anger or bitterness or whatever it is, the stuff we all experience. We all have that stuff. But we replay that over and over. And then there's this realization that, okay, a lot of my suffering, it's time-related. I'm either thinking about something that happened in the past or I'm thinking about something that I'm afraid might happen in the future and both of those are suffering. I find that I'm almost never right here in the present moment with this, with what is actually happening. And so part of just getting in touch with our real experience of here and now, in this present moment, what we're really feeling right now, it's very different. But it's so different from the way we're programmed to go about life that we all sort of have a hard time getting to it, you know? Um, so again, with the experience of sitting here in meditation and coming upon the things that we would normally call pain, when we start to react to something like that, a lot of times it's not a reaction to the actual physical thing, but it's a reaction to our ideas about it. It's, I don't think I'll be able to tolerate this for, for very long, or I really want to move, but I don't want to move and disturb, you know, the others, or, you know, there's so, such a small slice of that experience is the actual pain. So much of the rest of it is our ideas about it, related to the past or related to the future. And so, yeah, so many of us have that experience of, so if I just sort of make peace with what's happening, that's, it is happening anyway. Now this is different from, here's a hot, boiling hot pan and it's burning my hands, I'm just gonna make peace with this. No, you pull your hands away. But whatever is really happening, I mean, that's what's happening. You, your, your choice is either to be with it um, and flow with it like that parable or to fight it and resist it, and that's where suffering comes from. In the hand on, one thing that really struck me was complete radio control. And then you can't control, you know, it's like a lot of stress and anxiety, and like the thoughts you have when you're trying to sleep, those, those come and you can't control. And sometimes I think people that abuse drugs and alcohol are trying to control uh, some part of themselves to make themselves happy. Mm -hmm. And like what you're saying, if you just flow and realize that everything in life is impermanent, things are changing all the time, if you just try and almost like release control of it mm -hmm. or something. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And but the but that and what you're talking about is really kind of the essence of this I, me, this self. These are really um it's it's a mental construct that we create about how it is we're going to relate to the world around us. And a lot of that is out of, out of this fear of not having control or enough control or wanting to relate to the rest of the world in a certain way. Like, you know, in my, in my past I've shared a lot of the stuff that kind of brought me to all of these realizations into this uh, path and this practice. But one of them was, um, you know, having having grown up with not much money, I mean, we were we were fairly poor, um, or just you know we didn't have a lot of money anyway. Um, but having grown up with that experience, and experiencing you know sort of the same sadness and depression and anxiety and all the stuff that everyone else in the world feels, we're we're always looking for what what can I attribute that to? You know, what's the cause of this? And for me. A lot of it I started to associate with, well, you know, my friends, they have such nice houses, they have such nice stuff, nice, such nice clothes, and they seem happier, and so, you know, I want to have nice stuff like that. I want to, you know, I, I associate these things with um, having some kind of money or set, having some material possessions, and I think a lot of us make that association, and so we sort of set our sights on that, and we begin our journey of life to acquire 
and we start by I'm gonna you know finish school and then I'm gonna get my degree and then I'm gonna get a job and then when I get a job then I can get money and then when I get money I can get stuff and then when I get stuff I can get respect and then but it never stops you never get to a point because I actually had and I've shared this story my list of ingredients of happiness because I got this self-help book once many years ago about how to attract all the stuff into your life that you want and yeah you can actually do that the problem is is it doesn't make you happy in fact it makes you feel worse because now you've got to pay for it all now you've got to protect it now you're invested in it psychologically and this becomes part of your identity and so if any of it is starts to you know go downhill or you're losing it or at risk of losing it then there's more misery you know all control all control yeah so you know that was very much my experience was going out and getting all these things on my to-do list and sort of checking it off and um, somewhere I still have it I have that I have that book with all the stuff I wrote in there and I saved it as kind of a this is an important thing to remember is that we think the ingredients of happiness are out there but they're not because you can go get all that stuff and realize happiness is not there. And so now what do I do? And so yeah, coming upon that, whether it's that grief of being in the presence of real joy and freedom and happiness and then having to back out of it, or it's the, the grief of realizing that what you've been searching for isn't where you thought it was, and now you've got to figure something else out. Tremendous amount of pain and suffering comes with that. Um, and just a really simple example uh, that I wrote in the handout, but it sort of illustrates it. If, uh, if you have a new iPhone or a new smartphone and you've got this phone and you drop it on the ground and it, you know it lands on its face on the rocks or something and you pick it up, I mean we've had experiences like that right if everybody hasn't had that exact experience you've had something like that something that you wanted and you kind of treasure and it falls and oh you know I mean that hurts and there's like this weird kind of grief over this the scratch on my screen of my new phone that's one thing you just observe that somebody else walking through a parking lot they drop their phone you see them drop it, they pick it up. Now, the feeling is quite different. Now, it's not like you're saying, ha ha, but, you know, it's not as intense if it doesn't happen to you. The exact same thing is happening. So this is kind of what I get back to. If there's like intrinsic suffering in dropping a phone, then why is it when that person drops theirs and I drop mine, the feeling is completely different? You know, it's because of our relationship to these things. And yeah, a lot of it does come back to control. I would like to control my life so that um, bad stuff stays out of it. And I would like to control my life so that good stuff comes into it. But, but that very approach, um, we, start to, uh, we start to move ourselves further away from it. Um, uh, if if you have ever known someone who is uh, in an abusive relationship where there's physical or emotional abuse of some sort or both and maybe you've known maybe you've known someone and they've been in a relationship like that and then they finally get out of it and you think thank goodness they finally got out of this horrible relationship and then they find someone else who's almost the same or just as bad um, and sometimes we look at people like that and we say, you know, what, what is wrong with this person? Why are they, why are they doing this over and over? Well, in some ways, I think it goes back to that control piece. Is that sometimes the fear for a person to really open up into what could be a good relationship? There's also a lot of fear of you know I'm not worthy of somebody really great I'm not worthy of somebody that isn't a jerk and so I'll and this is unconscious of course but it's so so I'll always sort of settle with this predictable outcome of just this uh, dysfunctional type of relationship because I can control that 
you know, in a, again, I don't think it's a conscious, yet yeah, this is exactly how I'm going to do it, but there is sort of this, um, I remember, uh, you know, with, with buddies in high school, if there was like sort of the, the beautiful girl that you wanted to ask out, um, but there was always sort of this one that was too good for you, you know? And so you wouldn't dare because you know you were just going to, you know, you are going to get your legs taken out from under you. And so, you know, you, you'd set your sights, you know, a horrible way of saying it, you'd set your sights lower, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, we sort of repeat that over and over in our lives. You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And isn't that interesting? We all have, yeah, we all work with this stuff in, in some different ways. It's interesting. But I find, I find it funny because we, you know, everyone, it's like, yep, I get it. Yeah, yeah, it it really is, and well, part. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the um, one of the simplest things is, and we did it in the practice, which is um, we're all sitting there watching our breath, observing our breath, right? And then, yeah, sooner or later, something distracts you. And so it's a sound or a feeling in your body or a thought, you're, you're having a mental image or a memory. And normally, um, if we're trying to not be distracted by something like that. That's aversion. We're pushing against that. So there's resistance to it. And that creates conflict in the body. The, the, the very reaction to it, approaching it in that way, this is a bad thing, I don't want to have anything to do with it. It creates more, um, uh, yeah, more tension, more anxiety. And then you're sort of, you're in combat with this thing. This practice of approaching it with a real softness of okay there's a there there's a there's a negative thought but kind of the way we did with the pain it's not my affliction this is not my horrific pain this is not something i need to battle with but there's sort of this oh there's pain here in this experience can i be okay with that can i just allow it space to be as it is and then we find that we're able to keep ourselves on track with the rest of our meditation. So if one thing that you might try is that practice as you're going to bed to try and do that body scan from top to bottom, 
all the way through. Um, yeah. Like sort of narrating the experience of breathing. So you're concentrating on your breath, yeah. not on whatever monkey mind. Yeah. And yeah, then that works. So or, or just reciting the full drama of the heart. Mm-hmm. Is that fun? Yeah, yep. I inhale loving kindness. Right. So you can start reciting something like that or just like you can pray. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and it's... But, uh, Mm-hmm. You know, it's more of a getting rid of that evil. Who said that that, that, that um, not worthy or not good? It's just the way it was. I mean, we're, I'm, I don't know if I'm expressing it. I, the evil is in the way. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and your... Um, Part of the first, part of what we need to do is to become aware of, you know, sort of how all this is working, because that's really the first step. Um, we all have this experience of going to bed, thinking about something that's really troublesome, having that bother us. Um, waking up the next morning, a lot of times you pick up right where you left off. You know, it's sort of like I was thinking about that, and now this is sort of how I begin my day. And a lot of times we share the idea that this moment of consciousness sets the stage for the next moment of consciousness. And it's this continuous flow. So if you're, um, if you're in resistance, if you're in conflict with what is happening, you're in conflict. Now there might be something that's happening, but there's conflict. And so part of it is this awareness of I am reacting with... Uh, aversion with negativity to this I'm having nasty thoughts and you know like negative thoughts about somebody and I feel bad about that I should be better than that I shouldn't be thinking bad thoughts about somebody and and so you kind of beat yourself up about it that starts this process of reacting that feeling of beating yourself up is a negative feeling you don't want to have that it starts to uh, it starts this cycle what is the why are you right? It's the same car as a negative habit energy. It's just a negative half pattern. Oh, I don't think I think the evil is there. But the respond don't react. Yeah, yeah, and there's um, and we're we're like out of time, and I'm thinking of so many things that I want to share. What I'd like to do is next week we pick it up right here. And we just we keep talking about it because it seems like yeah we're all sort of right at a point where we we can all relate to this. Um, what I would like to leave you with is that yeah in every moment that you're alive you're aware of something you're aware of whatever your thoughts are you're aware of um, your experience you're aware of it at some level. So a lot of times we'll have troublesome thoughts difficult thoughts unpleasant thoughts and we don't like those so we we kind of we kind of tamp them down a little bit you know we just we kind of keep those just a little bit below the surface level of consciousness the problem is you're reacting to that anyway you're you're having the experience and you're reacting to it you're having those thoughts and you're reacting to it but you've kind of pushed them down so it's almost like if you have a pot of boiling water on the stove and you don't want it to bubble anymore you hold the lid down to keep it from bubbling over well you know it just builds up more pressure and in a way that's what's happening with us when we have these negative um, thoughts and feelings and we we kind of we we just want to have a little distance from those and so we don't we don't deal with it we don't address it and then as a result we're reacting to it at this unconscious level of the mind creating all sorts of anxiety 
So a big part of this practice is to become aware of it like at the surface level of consciousness. So we're actually experiencing it as it comes up and then interrupting that what would normally be the reaction of just going right into rage or guilt or fear or you know fill in the blank the normal stuff so and it's not judging it. and not judging it because it's a um, a lot of this too is um, it's kind of hard not to take your personal experience personally and but really uh, if you can look at it a little more impersonally um, like you know the universe unfolds in an orderly way. Things happen because this set one thing into motion and this happened as a, as a uh, result of that. And so, yeah, uh, your experience, although it's your personal experience, um, it's not because it's your fault or your bad or you deserve it or, you know, I mean, things are unfolding and there's a certain impersonality to that and we can learn to step back from it. It's part of this, this ego and this I thing. So we'll, we'll leave it here and we'll talk about this more next week because I think it's important and, and I think it's helpful. So. That's neat. That's neat. Yeah, kind of a Native American. Wow. Well, that's wonderful. Different cultures do the same thing. Cuts through every, um, you know, every imaginary uh, division that we have: you know, race, gender, culture, political affiliation. Yeah, we all have the same same experience but let's um, let's just take a minute to uh, before we before we leave I'll just guide you through a one minute meditation here of what are called the four Brahma Viharas and four Brahma Viharas is a way of saying the four highest states of consciousness or sometimes the four divine abodes but what they are is compassion loving kindness, empathetic joy, and equanimity, peacefulness, and freedom. And so let's just take a minute to cultivate each one of those four Brahma Viharas and sort of project it outward. We've had this wonderful opportunity to share meditation together tonight and to share discussion and, um, uh, and it's, it's wonderful and it's joyful. To, to, to share this and so we can think to ourselves and we can be aware of all the other beings out there in the world who are experiencing suffering and difficulty in their lives in many different ways and without getting into who they are or how they got that way we can say may all beings be free from suffering and just project that out from your heart. Really feel it. May all beings be free from suffering. And likewise, may all beings be surrounded by love and kindness. Real love and kindness. <coughs> may all beings experience real joy, real happiness. Not the happiness from possessions or money but real joy and may all beings experience equanimity peacefulness freedom and most especially may you in this room sharing this time with me tonight may you all be truly truly happy
Namaskar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. It's a joy. Thank you. It's become an important part of our life. Wonderful. And you're making a difference. You know, tonight especially, I was like, wow, I can't believe how quickly that went. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Keep working on it. Well, um, stop.